all is quiet on the morning of January 21st, 1941. Gazelle Force, an Anglo-Indian armored column, is resting at the Karoo Gorge in Eritrea, then part of Italian East Africa. The gazelles are pursuing the forces of the Duke of Aosta, the Italian commander in the region. Little does Gazelle Force know that 250 Eritrean horsemen led by Italian Lieutenant Amadeo Gillier are about to burst onto the scene, galloping through the morning mist and straight toward their prey. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. Today's video, Times Italy was effective during the Second World War. Yeah, it actually happened, and more than once. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, NordVPN, for making this video possible. The performance of the Italians in World War II has long been ridiculed and subjected to excessive spaghetti and pizza memes rather than objective scrutiny. But it is true that overall, Italy was unready for a prolonged conflict in 1940. The country had minimal industrial capacity, a chronic fuel shortage, and was exhausted from previous conflicts. But those are topics for another video. Today, we're focusing on the times that Italy displayed military effectiveness during the war, despite the odds stacked against them. Speaking of which, whatever happened to Lieutenant Gillier and his horsemen? Gillier and his men charge into the armored cars of gazelle force with pistols, swords, and hand grenades. As the defenders are cut down by sabers and shrapnel, Gillier's squadron regroups and launches a second charge. The gazelle artillery fires back, killing friends and foes alike in the confusion. After a few seconds, Gillier, known as the Devil Commander, disperses his squadron in the gorges surrounding Karoo. That was the last cavalry charge ever faced by the British Army. While Gillier lost more than half of his unit, his daring display allowed the Duke of Aosta to organize defenses in Agordat and Karen, where Italians and their colonial troops would resist Commonwealth forces for two months. The Devil Commander would go on to wage a guerrilla war against the British in East Africa. And there are plenty more examples of the Italians fighting against distinctly unfavorable odds on a larger scale that are worth considering, from the Eastern Front to the Battle of the Mediterranean to the last stand at El Alamein. Now let's take a look at Italy's contribution on the Eastern Front during Operation Barbarossa. From September 1941 to August 1942, General Giovanni Messe led the 60,000-man strong Italian Expeditionary Corps against the Soviet Union. The Corps was assigned to the Ukrainian section of the Eastern Front. Their baptism by fire took place at the Battle of Petrikoka during the last week of September. The 79th Infantry Regiment established a bridgehead over the River Dnieper, pushing a Soviet contingent back in the process. When the Germans lost their bridgehead in nearby Voinovka, the 80th Italian Regiment recovered it with a bayonet charge. Once the Torino Division pushed its enemy back, General Messe orchestrated a pincer movement with the help of Bersayedi assault units, capturing 10,000 Soviet prisoners, suffering a mere 300 casualties in the process. The expeditionary force next saw combat during the assault on Stalino. Italian cavalry regiments used clever tactics to rout Soviet defenders, charging only after their machine gunners had a chance to dismount and lay down suppressive fire. With the path cleared, Italian divisions prepared for their main assault on Stalino. On the 20th of October, four surrounding towns were occupied as a preemptive measure to block any Soviet counterattacks. And with their flanks secure, a regiment of Bersayedi stormed Stalino before breaking up into small motorized units, which took the Soviets by surprise. These mobile troops were supported by mounted artillery, who were able to change positions quickly to avoid enemy fire while raining shells on its unfortunate opponents. 
By July of 1942, the Italian Expeditionary Corps in Russia had grown in size, becoming the Armier, the Italian Army in Russia. But increased numbers did not intimidate Soviet forces. Near the River Don, the Red Army clashed with the Savoya Cavalry Regiment. The Savoyas had been surrounded by the men of the 812th Siberian Infantry Regiment, but managed to hold them back with their howitzers. When the 812th started withdrawing, the Savoyas' second squadron ordered an attack. This engagement became known as the Charge of Ispushensky, the last major cavalry charge in history. The squadron tore through the Soviet line, hacking down men with safety shredding them with machine guns and bombarding them with grenades. Meanwhile, the 4th Squadron had dismounted and engaged the enemy from the front, while the 3rd Squadron launched their own charge on the remnants of the Siberian Regiment. By the end of the battle, the Savoya Regiment had lost 84 men and 100 horses. The Soviets suffered a staggering 1,050 casualties. The engagement took the pressure off of larger Italian units in the area, granting them enough time to fortify against the offensive on the Don. However, this would prove futile, as in December 1942, Operation Uranus and Saturn would drive the Axis forces back west. Now, let's move somewhere a bit warmer for our next theater, the Mediterranean, which saw the Italian and British navies in a bitter struggle for control over indispensable supply routes. Cavalry charges aren't particularly effective in the water, so we won't be seeing any more of those. One of the key moments of this naval conflict was the raid on Alexandria. This was the most spectacular success of the 10th MAS Flotilla, the commandos of the Italian Royal Navy. The operation was led by notorious Corvette captain Prince Junio Valerio Borghese, a Roman aristocrat. This raid relied on the most secretive weapons of the 10th MAS, the manned torpedoes. These were self-propelled torpedoes on which two scuba divers could sit astride. Their tactic was to infiltrate enemy ports, approach their ship, and attach a magnetic mine to the hull. On December 19, 1941, Borghese submarine Shire approached the port of Alexandria and launched three manned torpedoes. The raid made contact with their targets, a tanker, a destroyer, and the British Royal Navy battleships HMS Valiant and HMS Queen Elizabeth. However, just as they placed the explosives, two of Borghese's men were captured and held on the Valiant. Despite this, the commandos did not reveal the nature of their mission until the last possible moment, leaving the crew with no time to do anything besides abandon ship. When the charges went off, Valiant, Queen Elizabeth, and the other two ships sank in the shallow waters of Alexandria. Overnight, the Axis navies had gained strategic superiority over the central and eastern Mediterranean, thanks to some Italian human torpedoes. Superiority in the Mediterranean was a key factor in securing supplies to the Italian and German armies in North Africa. But as we know, the Axis powers' logistical train eventually could not keep up with the might of the Allies, who gained the upper hand in late 1942. The Second Battle of El Alamein was an Axis defeat the end of the beginning, as Churchill described it. But even in defeat, the tenacity of the outnumbered, outgunned Italian units allowed Erwin Rommel's forces to evade total destruction. At the start of the battle, the Ariete Division, with the help from a Bersaglieri battalion and units from the Brescia and Folgere divisions, held back Montgomery's 13th Corps long enough to prevent it from reaching the main front line. Armored Division Latorio then went on the attack against the 133rd British Lorried Infantry Brigade. The assault virtually annihilated the British unit, knocking out their exposed anti-tank guns, killing 60 men, and capturing 300. On the 2nd of November, the 9th British Armored Brigade launched another attack, but lost 70 of its 94 tanks to Barsayedi artillery fire. The following day, General Rommel praised the sacrifice of Italian divisions covering his withdrawal. 
Enormous dust clouds could be seen south and southeast of headquarters, where the desperate struggle of the small and inefficient Italian tanks of 20th Corps was being played out against a hundred or so British heavy tanks. I was later told by Major von Luck that the Italians, who at the time represented our strongest motorized force, fought with exemplary courage. The last Italian unit to fight at El Alamein was the Folgare Division of elite paratroopers. This is when the lions truly roared, holding back three British divisions and one free French brigade with little ammunition and almost no anti-tank guns. The Folgare lured the attackers into a cul-de-sac, then attacked from all sides using Molotov cocktails and grenades. The assault cost the Allies 120 tanks. The Italians retreated slowly, protecting the rear of the Africa Corps, always refusing to surrender. After El Alamein, the Folgare continued fighting in Libya and Tunisia. By the end of the North African campaign, their 5,000-man strong division was reduced to a little more than 300 men. In the end, Italian armed forces were destined to lose the war. Their strategic, doctrinal, and logistical flaws were too overwhelming. But when they had adequate equipment, leadership, and morale, they performed well, scoring victories or delaying defeat through ingenuity and determination. Do let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear more examples of military effectiveness from the ridiculed nations of the Second World War. If you're familiar with the history of the Second World War, then you'll know that the vital role of data security, or lack thereof, played in its outcome. But these days, you don't have to rely on an Enigma machine to keep your identity safe online. Instead, you can use NordVPN, which has over 5,200 servers in 62 countries and uses military-grade encryption to keep your data as safe as possible, protecting you against hackers and malware even when when you're connected to public Wi-Fi networks. Enjoy the anonymity of this unlimited bandwidth VPN on up to six PC, iOS, and Android devices simultaneously. Oh, and you can watch television, movies, and even YouTube videos that are blocked in your country simply by connecting to a new server. All of this and more for just $3.49 a month. Using the link in the description will grant you a 70% discount, plus two whole months free if you use my promo code HISTORY at checkout. And if you aren't happy, you have access to a 30-day money-back guarantee. subjected to excessive spaghetti and pizza memes rather than objective scrutiny. Power off. Why does it do that? Help fight demonetization by visiting thearmchairhistorian.com.